uh, when President Trump took office, uh, he made it clear that he was not going to sell his uh, ownership interest in family businesses that created conflicts of interest. Uh, that he was going to take advantage of the fact that the president is exempt from the criminal conflict of interest statute. Uh, and he showed no interest in uh, the question of whether he was in violation of the uh, Monuments Clause of the Constitution, which prohibits profits and benefits from foreign governments. Uh, and the Trump empire, the business empire, does a lot of business uh, with foreign governments, uh, obtains financing from uh, the Bank of China, other government-controlled uh, institutions, and does other business with foreign governments. President Trump showed no interest in selling off his interest in the Trump business empire in order to become president. Congress needs to change its attitude. Uh, the approach to ethics, uh, particularly in the past uh, several decades, uh, has been uh, highly partisan. Uh, the uh, appropriateness of uh, conduct in uh, office has been measured by the political party of the person whose conduct is being evaluated. This is a very serious situation. <laughs> Congress isn't dealing with it. Uh, and uh, I think that a lot of voters are going to conclude that that's because a majority of the members of the House and the Senate are Republicans. I'm a Republican. I've been a Republican for 30 years. I think this is going to be a disaster for the Republican Party in the fall of, um, of uh, 2018. I think we need to um, uh, recommit ourselves to the rule of law. We need to get away from the notion uh, that uh, uh, there are uh, no absolute truths of right and wrong uh, in the law and in morality. Uh, I think for too long we've been operating under a moral relativism uh, where uh, we view uh, right and wrong as a product of power. The uh, vast majority of, uh, of lawyers in this country and certainly of ordinary Americans had no idea who I was. Uh, and uh, really had no idea what the Office of Government Ethics is. Uh, most law students uh, have no idea what the Office of Government Ethics is or didn't until about two years ago. Well, this changed dramatically with President Trump because of his attitude uh, toward ethics, uh, toward the Office of Government Ethics uh, itself, toward the uh, career officials who work in the Office of Government Ethics, uh, toward uh, persons such as myself who uh, specialize in uh, government ethics. Uh, he has uh, had a very, very different attitude in that his has brought ethics uh, issues uh, front and center, as they should be, in the public dialogue. The uh, financial disclosure forms are incomplete. Uh, they do not provide sufficient disclosure when a public office holder, including the President of the United States, has an interest in a privately held company. Uh, you are required to list uh, your ownership interest in the privately held company, but you are not required to list on the financial disclosure form where that company borrows its money uh, or where that company gets revenue. Uh, a, a privately held company in the real estate business owned by the President of the United States could be borrowing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from Russia or from China or from the Middle East. Uh, we do not know where those privately held companies are borrowing their money. Uh, the financial disclosure form only requires disclosure of what you own and what you personally own. Uh, but many people in the real estate business and many other businesses don't do their borrowing at the personal level. That's exactly why Donald Trump was able to have a series of bankruptcies uh, for his companies. He himself personally never went bankrupt because he didn't guarantee the loans. He didn't borrow the money in his own name. Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Bredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. Aristotle and the ancient Greek philosophers believe that the study of ethics was a practical, rational way for people to achieve a character of excellence and virtue. That character would be a precondition for a person's happiness and well-being in leading a good life. The highest aim of life would be to pursue a moral clarity and think about what kind of human being you're going to choose to be. Athenian democracy, furthermore, developing around the 6th century BC, 
developed the first democracy in the world and was the perfect complement to this ethical ideal. Incomplete and, and imperfect as it was, it developed a political system that literally meant people power. Its strength lay in the high level of ethical cultivation and a broad, deep education that produced whole, enlightened members of society. America itself began its own incomplete and imperfect social experiment in democracy with a revolutionary political system and a dream to create an inclusive, egalitarian society based on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Contemporary philosophers like Cornell West follow in that tradition and urge us to confront those bleak historical moments, and certainly this is one of them, with critical compassion and delicate, difficult conversations. Rather than respond to terror or injustice or difficulty by imposing terror or injustice on others, stay alert to the suffering of others. Keep track of any form of harm, of unwarranted hurt, and hold ourselves to high moral standards. All these catastrophes in America are coalescing at the same time. We need to resist becoming overcome by despair and selling out to greed and venality where everything is up for sale. As West puts it, you can't hate your way through this. In recent years, we've moved further and further away from these radical dreams and toward the end of our experiment in democracy. We're increasingly dominated by an administration that's based on an ethical world distorted by fear, hate, and scapegoating. One whose ethical framework is run by gangster oligarchs and a winner-take-all disaster capitalism rooted in the greed of who can be bought off. Our political life is increasingly controlled by a dangerous and ethically challenged president, a pathological liar who's dedicated to destroying what's left of our democracy. His own well-documented intellectual laziness, racism, misogyny, emotional immaturity, megalomania, and narcissism is part of our uncomfortable daily existence. But as a psychiatrist, Robert J. Lifton warns, his malignant normality must not become the norm of our political culture. Today's guest on the Radical Imagination is Richard Painter. He's been an articulate and powerful voice for decades, an, act, an advocate who has been involved in making sure America fulfills its promise as a just and inclusive democracy, rooted in ethical integrity and creative excellence. He's the S. Walter Ritchie Professor of Corporate Law at the University of Minnesota, and since 2016 has served as Vice Chair of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. To confront corruption in Washington, he's proposed what he calls the strongest ethics reform package in U.S. history. From 2005 to 2007, he was the chief White House ethics lawyer in the George W. Bush administration. He's a frequent and sought after media commentator, ran for Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party nomination for U.S. Senate in 2018, and is a prolific writer and author. And I'm so glad he's here for the first time on the Radical Imagination. I know you've got a, a hugely busy schedule, and I'm so glad you are there uh, sitting in Minnesota at this point, right? Absolutely. Right here in beautiful Lakes, Minnesota. Right Great. Terrific. Thank you so much for being here and for helping us understand your life's work, which uh, for a variety of reasons, many people don't don't even know that there is this branch of government that is concerned with the ethics in business and the ethics uh, in government. Uh, and also, I know you're interested also in the ethics of lawyers. So tell us a little about that work, how you got started in this and, uh, and, and give our audience an understanding of what, what you're all about here. Well, I started my... Uh legal career in New York City is a transactional lawyer doing corporate transactional work. And I um, then went to law teaching in 1993, starting at the University of Oregon. I'm still a member of the New York Bar. I uh, have uh, only one uh, pending case in uh, New York, but I believe I'm listed as counsel of record. It's a 
a lawsuit against Donald Trump under the Mimas Clause of the Constitution. Uh, I spent a lot of my time uh, in my early years worrying about uh, the problems of business ethics and what lawyers could do to prevent uh, first the savings and loan collapse that we had in the early 1990s. Uh, it was a debacle, uh, caused a recession in the early 90s. And then, of course, what we had in 2008 uh, and uh, over quite a long period of time, I urge the lawyers to be more proactive in uh, not only encouraging, but requiring corporate clients to the extent they could to comply with the law. Uh, and I, I notice a lot of things going on, whether it's on Wall Street or elsewhere, that uh, lawyers, uh, if they had high moral standards, uh, could prevail. Uh, and then I moved into government ethics uh, when I was asked to be the chief White House ethics lawyer in the Bush administration. And uh, of course, I saw that a lot of our problems uh, with regulating Wall Street, regulating finance before 2008 were very closely linked to the problems we have with ethics in government. Not only our campaign finance system, but the financial institutions would buy influence with both of the major political bodies, uh, but also the revolving door in and out of government uh, of uh, Wall Street executives and others into the top treasury department posts and then back. And, uh, you obviously had a problem with the fox watching the uh, the chicken coop there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've had a lot of problems before Donald Trump came along. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't have to tell you as a New Yorker what Donald Trump's reputation was in New York. Uh, I guess mm -hmm. got a, a piece of it from the time I spent in New York and uh, my family members who lived in New York a lot longer than I had. Uh, he certainly didn't have a very good business reputation at all. Right. And uh, that wasn't uh, discussed enough uh, in the press in New York. Uh, there's one thing I fault the New York Times for. I mean, they do excellent reporting, yeah. but they were very reticent to call him out. Uh, and some other people who were uh, of dubious character in, in New York, uh, sort of high finance or real estate. And, you know, of course, you had the Helmsleys and everything. Yeah. But, People weren't interested until there was a big high profile trial like Leona okay. Helmsley or something. Okay, that so that's what I'm saying. And until it becomes so out of line, then pay attention. But uh it's not something that they usually in a routine way uh keep an eye on, correct? Well, exactly. And also Donald Trump uh, uh people were more interested in his sex life and his divorce case, of course. So that was written up his first divorce case uh, with a Ivana, uh, I believe that was even back when I was in New York. And, you know, the tabloids would pick that up. And right. the New York Times would consider that beneath them. Uh, so the attitude over at the Times, you just didn't write very much about Donald Trump. Uh, and, uh, you know, they had occasional things. But uh, people didn't understand uh, the, the, the real uh, lack of ethics in, uh, in this enterprise he ran. They had $900 million worth of casino bonds that went bust in Atlantic City. And and that only became an issue when the big investment houses lost their money. I mean, Solomon Brothers told their best clients to get out of Trump casino bonds. I think it was back in 1990. Well, right. then it starts to concern people. And people exactly. get worried about who's this Donald Trump guy. But there's very little coverage of, um, of what was going on in the Trump organization. So, as Calvin Coolidge put it, right, the business of America is business. So, you were a Republican, right, most of your adult life until the last couple of years or so. So, you saw the corruption, but, but again, isn't it basically the way America is operating? And that's what its foundation, the business of America is business. So, what's, what's wrong here? Well, there's How good we business. Yes, there's good business and there's bad business. Uh, and uh, I, mean, I think there are a lot of very good businesses in, right there in New York. And, and uh, this is why Cyrus Vance, the Manhattan District Attorney right now, is trying to enforce the money laundering laws and, and so forth and going after the Trump Organization. Because we can't have New York banks being used to launder payoffs to mistresses for politicians and violating the federal election laws. Uh, New York City, uh, we, certainly we've had our, uh, the problems with the financial crisis in 2008 and so forth, but the last thing uh, you need is, is your banks being turned into 
a, a front for, for secret payoffs, whether it's mistresses or hitmen or whoever. I mean, this is what's done in banks and some other parts of the world, but hopefully not in New York. And this is why we need to enforce the law. Uh, we've had several very good prosecutors in, in New York, uh, both the state attorneys general and Manhattan DAs that crack down on this type of stuff. Uh, even Elliot Spitzer, before he got in trouble, uh, was very good at going after Wall Street. That's what you need. You know, this is a big difference between good business and bad business. And if you don't have law enforcement and you also don't have aggressive coverage in the press uh, of what bad business people are up to, uh, then the public doesn't really understand the difference uh, between a high quality business person and someone like Donald Trump. But agree, totally agree. But isn't Trump part of a much larger corporate real estate development culture in New York in particular. And actually, quite frankly, isn't he sort of small potatoes in this? I mean, the fact that now, of course, he's the president and uh, makes a difference. But this has been going on for a while and still continues, right? Well, the, the real estate business in New York has always been questionable. Also, the relations they have with the politicians. So, I mean, for years, people thought that uh, Donald Trump was a Democrat because he'd spent all his time trying to grease the skids in, in uh, City Hall. And then uh, Rudy Giuliani got in there and then he just, uh, I think, discovered he was a Republican. Uh, we had people, not just Trump, we had the uh, Helmsleys and others. Uh, who are doing, you know, somewhat dubious things. But I have to say on a spectrum, though, uh, that the way the Trump organization operates uh, when it comes to ethics um, and, you know, the series of bankruptcies and so forth, uh, they're at one end of the spectrum. It may be a somewhat seedy spectrum in, in the New York real estate world, but uh, I got to say they're toward, the, uh, toward one end of that spectrum and it's not the good one. So... Understood. So understood. Um, so he's been he's going after him in, in the Southern District, New York, correct? Um, and what are the options now uh, for the federal government? Or, or is there anything that can be done at that level? Yes. And I will say Cyrus Vance, I believe at this point, has a grand jury in the New York Supreme Court. These are New York state courts. Uh, not in the uh, federal court for the Southern District of New York, but Cyrus Vance is, uh, so this is the power of the state of New York and the prosecutors of the state of New York to investigate. Uh, and this was argued yesterday in front of the United States Supreme Court. And under the 10th Amendment of the Constitution, the states have whatever powers are not delegated to the president and to Congress. And certainly the Manhattan DA has the right uh, to convene a grand jury in New York State Court and uh, seek documents from the Masers, the accounting firm for the Trump Organization, and other relevant documents that may pertain to money laundering and other crimes and violation of laws in the state of New York. So that's one uh, investigation. The other investigations, of course, you mentioned the federal government. And uh, of course, Congress has a duty uh, to oversee what goes on in the executive branch and issue subpoenas. Congress has issued subpoenas of the Trump Organization accounting firm, Mazars, and the bank, the Deutsche Bank. Um, and uh, that was argued. He, he simply ignored them, right? And he, well, he told Deutsche Bank and uh, uh, Mazars that they could not comply with the subpoenas unless this was run up to the United States Supreme Court. And so he delayed, because not only Donald Trump won't comply with the subpoenas, but he is compelled. The accounting firm, plus an international bank, Deutsche Bank, uh, to um, uh, to refuse to comply with the United States House of Representatives subpoenas. Uh, mm -hmm. That was argued in front of the court yesterday. Uh, and uh, once again, I, I believe that the arguments on behalf of the Trump uh, organization there were most unsatisfactory. It all boiled down to both cases, both the Cyrus Vance case and the congressional subpoenas. It boiled down to the argument, and well, he's president, and if you were to investigate him or any businesses he owns while he's president, that will interfere with his mm. official duties and make it impossible for him to work as hard as he has been to, for example, contain the COVID-19 crisis. Right. Okay. Um, well, I don't need to comment on that. Okay, I can't 
It, well, they actually <laughs> argued that to the U.S. Supreme Court with COVID-19 that extra attention is required from the president mm. and that mm. therefore these subpoenas are, are really even more pernicious and somehow uh, should be should be blocked by the U.S. Supreme Court. Has no shame. No shame. Um, you know, as you were talking, is this somewhat similar analogous to what's been going on in Israel with Netanyahu? Well, I'm not familiar with the entirety of that case. The one thing that has been made clear, I believe, is that prosecutors in Israel, one, can investigate uh, the prime minister uh, and also could indict the prime minister uh, and that they, we aren't, they aren't going through as many hurdles uh, over there as we are here uh, mm. with respect to the idea that somehow uh, that Benjamin Netanyahu, because he's prime minister, is somehow immune from investigation or prosecution. So I, I would say that Israel, at least conceptually, has a has a better view of this. That, they, that nobody's above the law. Uh, now, whether this actually works out and, and Benjamin Netanyahu is properly investigated and if he's guilty of anything, prosecuted, we have yet to see how that that plays out. There, there is uh, some significant evidence of, of corruption. Um, over there, but I haven't looked enough at the facts to know exactly uh, what any particular charges might be. Is it because we've sort of evolved here the last several de decades into sort of an imperial presidency or a very powerful executive branch? Is that part of the problem here in terms of bringing some integrity and investigation into the executive branch? Yeah, that's a big part of the problem. And, and that, that uh, I'd, I'd say, is a, a trend that went all the way back to FDR. Uh, mm -hmm. When we look to uh, uh, President Roosevelt to say, salvage this, uh, from the Great Depression, and we may be headed toward a similar, uh, we certainly have not seen these type of unemployment rates since the Great Depression that we have today, but it was a very dire situation. And uh, people looked to President Roosevelt for solutions, and he provided quite a few very good solutions. The Supreme Court got in his way, started striking things down, so he said he'd add a justice or two, and that quieted them down for a while. Uh, but he had the broad, broad support of Congress. And then we have World War II. And I think that was an example of where well, President Roosevelt was a great leader in, in World War II. The, you know, the decisions, for example, about the Japanese internment and so forth. And a, executive authority, even in the hands of a, of a good man, can be taken too far and could do something that we, we later understand was, was a serious violation of constitutional rights and human rights. Um, but moving on from the Roosevelt administration, uh, you know, with the nuclear age and Cold War and everything, that people look more and more to the president. Uh, Lyndon Johnson got us into the Vietnam situation very uh, much on his own before he ever went to Congress for the authorization of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and they didn't even tell the truth to Congress back in 1964. And then after that, we went through Nixon, and we all know what that was about in the imperial presidency. And it got so far that he had guards, apparently, in the White House who would get costumes from the Metropolitan Opera. <laughs> uh, it looked like those so soldiers. I don't know what it was, but yeah. some goofy thing that Nixon had going on. Wow. And, uh, and Nixon, of course, uh, insisted on executive privilege on his tapes. That case was discussed yesterday in front of the Supreme Court, where Nixon uh, told the special prosecutor, uh, Archie Cox, that he couldn't have the tapes. And uh, the tape, Nixon insisted on, he wouldn't turn them over and fired Archie Cox in the, in the uh, Saturday Night Massacre in October 73. Uh, and, and, you know, that was uh, this unitary executive theory they're all talking about. In other words, I'm in control of the executive branch. You don't, don't investigate me unless I let you investigate me. And if you have an independent prosecutor's investigating me, um, you, you know, you got to rein him in or fire him if I tell you to fire, fire him. him. Right. Uh, well, the difference is Nixon had to go through three, he, he had to go through, fire two attorneys general in order to get there, both uh, Elliot Richardson and Bill Ruckelshaus, before he got Bob Bork to do the dirty deed uh, and fire Archie Cox. And the Supreme Court, you know, pretty much unanimously made Nixon turn over the tapes. So the court stood up to the president. Um, it, and, but that, you know, the problem is, you know, in this, after Watergate, we thought about trying to uh, pull back on this imperial presidency. And for a while under Jimmy Carter, I think things 
pulled back a bit, but there were concerns about how he was running the country. And, and once you got Reagan in there and Ed Meese is the attorney general, it was the same ideology all over again that you had during the next years. And then they eventually got in trouble with Iran Contra doing whatever they wanted. Um, and, you know, going around Congress. Uh, and, you know, we all know that scandals under Clinton and Clinton inserting executive privilege with respect to uh, just about everything, including his personal life and his affairs. And uh, then with George W. Bush, the situation in Iraq, and, and once again, the whole notion that the, the president sort of makes all these decisions uh, on his own and, and the information given to Congress once again you know, misleading or similar to what happened back in 1964 in Vietnam. So uh, more and more power entrusted to the president. It's not a good situation, never was. We had a lot of executive orders under President Obama that where he tried to use his power to the maximum extent possible. I think they were well-intentioned, uh, but that's at the stage you get someone like Donald Trump walks in there. And this is the imperial presidency on steroids. So as you're describing this, it, it's this moral relativism that you've talked about that's rooted in power and has increasingly polarized society. It's not a rule of law. It's it's not. And, and part of what you're trying to do, as I understand, is is bring a, a level of consciousness to to the American pop, the public about this in the hope of what? In the hope of there being mass movements? What do we have left to uh, counteract the the power of this imperial president. The, 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 the press is, to a certain extent, still there. The Times is taking more uh, courageous stands, but, um, but we certainly don't have the sort of few Republican leaders that stood up to Nixon. Uh, we don't have that today. We have an attorney general that, you know, you've described already as someone that Trump has in his pocket. I mean, we're still waiting for his taxes, right? That was that was a campaign pledge. He said, well, it's being audited. I mean, this is the longest audit in history, right? So we're waiting for this. We're waiting for any financial di disclosure, the, uh, the, the the emollients clause that I think you've described it as basically payola. I mean, it's yeah. bribes. So, so um, uh, you know, wh where do you see the hope here? Um, well, the hope is in the election. We're going to have to throw him out and well, you know, uh, throw out some of these senators who've been cut down to him. We're just going to have to say, we're going to get to some I didn't wanna, Yeah, I didn't want to make this total doom and gloom here, but that was my next question. Are you significantly worried about the fact that the election may not even take place, maybe postponed for whatever reason? Well, there, you know, Jared Kushner was mouthing off about that possibility uh, right. Mm -hmm. recently, I believe it was Time Magazine or somebody, and yeah, and I hope that's getting shut down. The election has to be on November 3rd, pursuant to a statute. If they're going to change the date of the election, they'd have to pass the statute in both houses of Congress. The okay. president's term expires in January, and the vice president's term expires in January. So they have that election, or they don't, and I guess uh, Nancy Pelosi becomes the president. Uh, and it's... Uh, Okay. You know, they're not going to be playing around here. They're, they have a four-year term, and it's not being extended unless they win another term. And I don't think they're going to try and postpone the election. What they're going to do, though, is stir up a lot of fear and try and get coronavirus going. So in the urban areas like Philadelphia, Cleveland, Detroit, key states, Pennsylvania and Ohio, Michigan, in the urban areas, you have a lot of voters who might be afraid to go to the polls. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would, you know, the turnout, I believe, would be affected more by coronavirus in the urban areas than in the rural areas. So mm -hmm. more in New York City than in upstate New York, more in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh than out in the, in, in the uh, rural areas of Pennsylvania. So there is a concern about the way this election is going to go down. And then we got the Russians are getting in the act. Uh, and there, there are various things going on with the Russians, but it, it seems like a repeat of the attacks on Hillary in, two, in 2016 uh, yeah, that's going on there. Uh, so put all that together, I think there'll be an election, but there are going to be a lot of games being played. Right. Just spend a couple of minutes on that 
that theme of the Russians' involvement uh, in our election, because that's sort of something we've not been talking about as much recently. But you're a, a strong uh, voice saying that they did significantly interfere and continue to interfere, correct? Well, yes, their interference in 2016 is very clearly laid out in the first half of the Mueller report. Uh, of course, a lot of the first half of the Mueller report was redacted by Bill Barr, the attorney general, at the request of Donald Trump. But even what we could see in the first half of the Mueller report is conclusive. The Russians interfere in a very high levels in very influential ways. And it's clear the Trump campaign knew about it. Now, the Trump campaign apparently did not actually conspire with the Russians. Uh, criminally. Uh, and that probably makes sense because I don't think the Russians need the incompetence of the Trump organization to enter into a criminal conspiracy. They really didn't need them, probably didn't want them. They gave, kept them abreast of what they're doing. And of course, the Russians expect something in return, whether it's being able to do whatever they want in Ukraine or Crimea or whatever. Um, in 2020, uh, there's some evidence the Russians, I mean, there's been a lot of talk to the intelligence community. Once again, Donald Trump is able to classify a lot of it. Uh, so if we're finding out that the Russians are doing stuff, you know, we're only hearing what's in the public arena. And uh, a lot of it may be classified information, and he's going to want to keep it classified. So we don't know what the Russians are doing. But it, it appears a lot of the same social media antics are going on. Um, there may very well be computer hacking going on. Uh, you know, we've got this person who's accused uh, of Joe Biden of sexual assault 27 years ago, who happens to have written op-eds talking about how Vladimir Putin is just incredibly sexy or intoxicating to women. I mean, I don't know what's going on there, but I don't like the whole thing with the Russians. I wish they'd mind their business and, and we could mind ours. Exactly right. Well, you know, we met, I guess it was about a year Ago, so at, at, in the Washington Press Club, when we you were speaking on behalf of the World Mental Health Coalition, Bandy Lee at that time, uh, who has been, as you know, advocating a prescription for survival and has edited um, recent books on the dangerous case of Donald Trump. So, what legally are you working with that with Bandy and and that organization to legally challenge or in some way? Uh, pursue uh, a level of consciousness where we begin to fully, really appreciate how dangerous this this president is. Well, I believe at this point the only legal mechanism is the Twenty Fifth Amendment, the Constitution, that we would use to remove a mentally incompetent president. I believe the Twenty Fifth Amendment should be invoked, but it can only be invoked by a majority of the president's cabinet. And this president has surrounded himself with uh, you know, yes men and yes women in the cabinet. Anybody questions his confidence, such as his former Secretary of State, T. Rex Tillerson, I mean, has been discharged. So uh, the chances of actually uh, using the 25th Amendment to address this problem are very, very low. We have to address it on election day. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is where Bandy comes in, um, because she has made it clear, as have many other psychiatrists and psychologists, that Donald Trump they view as extremely dangerous. And you just look at his Twitter feed and the way he talks and he thinks on Twitter. And you got to say, this man is absolutely nuts. Yeah. And yet we've entrusted him with nuclear weapons. Uh, unfortunately, the psychology, uh, the psychiatric community, uh, the establishment has come back after Bandy and said, you can't do that mm -hmm. because you're not allowed under our ethics rules to criticize the mental health or to diagnose um, a public figure, even though she's not diagnosing anybody. She's just saying, just look at this guy. He's extremely high risk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just as you would warn anybody uh, who's going to you be in a personal relationship with someone who appears to be high risk. Well, we're, we're going into a relationship here, supposedly for another four years, where he's going to control nuclear weapons, have the ability to destroy human civilization in 20 minutes. Uh, I believe that Bandy should be speaking out the American Psychiatric Association is giving her a hard time. They said, well, we got a rule that says you can't do it, the so-called Goldwater rule that came from when some psychologists and psychiatrists were concerned about Barry Goldwater's uh, disposition back in 1964. Um, 
I got to say, Barry Goldwater is a very stable genius compared with this guy we got in the White House now. I'd much rather have Gary, Barry Goldwater control the nukes. Yeah. He, he, Goldwater gives some impassioned speeches and, and really go after the communists and everything. But, you know, I remember. I remember. Yeah, I mean, the chances Johnson, he would have. And Johnson yeah. very slyly used the political jargon to to try to get people to think that he was nuts and and i remember i was in, a, in denver a kid in denver going to one of johnson's yeah. rallies and he said do you who do you want to have pushing on having the, the, the finger on that button and my mm -hmm. god we were all terrified of course mm -hmm. lbj and then a few years later he's gotten us all involved in yeah he was a lot of talk about peace so uh the <laughs> point right. is that it was abused. I mean, the Daisy Girl ad was a bit much. Right. The, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, right. so it was abused, and 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 the psychiatric profession. I've got to remind you, you know, doctors in those days were heavily Republican, and that uh -huh. was before all this uh, uh, social conservative nonsense got into the Republican Party. Of, you know, the obsession on abortion and everything. So in the old days, a lot of doctors were Republican. And the psychiatrist, you know, the psychiatrist said, we can't be used for politics. So we're going to put in this so-called Goldwater rule. You can't do that again. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is that they're trying to constrain the free speech of the members of the American Psychiatric Association. And, and this is a very dangerous situation we have here. Um, and I am also somewhat critical. The New York Times appears to have bought into this notion that psychiatrists shouldn't uh, make these types of comments. Um, well, I don't agree with that. I think if there's a danger and psyche, uh, uh, trained professionals such as Mandy Lee sees it, it is her duty, uh, her right and her duty to point that out. And I think she's right about this danger. And uh, that should be the more compelling interest, uh, of, uh, particularly for the New York Times, for the press, uh, than the question of, well, you know, the particular narrowly crafted rules of the American Psychiatric Association being complied with. Agreed, totally, totally. Um, I, you know, my opening was sort of this flowery short exposition about the ancient Greeks and their desire to create an enlightened uh, society of excellence and integrity, and then uh, making some quotes here from Cornell uh, about heeding the suffering of others and so on. I mean, is this, I personally very much believe this is a sort of discourse that we need, but but we're so far from that, aren't we? In terms of when we talk about ethics and morality, I mean, we're not getting down to hardly any of this, are we? Well, we're certainly very far from it under this administration because it's very clear everything is about Donald Trump. It's all yeah. about him, it, me, 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 my golf courses my right. business is my ego and uh, uh you know that that's what it's about for him we have a narcissist in the white house which is what the bandy lee has pointed out so uh, uh, uh we obviously need to have discussions of important issues how to provide health care for all americans how to uh, run our education system and what to do with our military policy but we can't do that until we have people of uh you know, at least somewhat committed to public service, not just to themselves, on all sides of the political spectrum, and then then have a robust debate about what kind of country we want to live in. And, you know, should you free markets, regulated markets, and what should income distribution look like? And, and we could have different views on some of these things, but you just can't have what's going on now, where it's just self-centered. It, it's just sure. Um, uh, obsession with oneself that's just not right as i think you well know i mean the last time we really heard that from any president or presidential candidate was john f kennedy correct and and made the point that that good people uh with a sense of morality and integrity should be getting into politics but but correct me if i'm wrong i mean that was 60 years ago i haven't heard any yes. president really come out and and, and say that well, yeah, I mean, I think there's some, you know, times of President Obama, I thought, gave some good good speeches yeah. about okay. public service. I, I, uh, he's quite eloquent, eloquent. Um, and 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 I believe, quite honest, I mean, the things I criticized in the Obama administration, I've criticized every administration, but, you know, you'd sense that a 
President Obama was trying and trying as hard as he could to do what he thought was right for the country, whether he's right or wrong, or whether he had too many executive orders and used his authority to do things that he, that Congress uh, probably should have been asked for permission for. And we can go through all that stuff. But right. you just sense that Barack Obama was a man who cared about his country and wanted to do the best he could. It wasn't about himself and his ego. Uh, it was about trying to, to, to do what he thought was right. Um, and yes, he wanted to get reelected in 2012. So there's politics, of course. Uh, but uh, it's just nothing like this, uh, this real pig out that we've seen for the past four okay. years. Are, are you planning, you, you ran in 2018 for the Senate. Are you planning to enter the political fray again? Oh, I don't know. I, I, no, I was no. a Republican for a long time, a liberal, moderate right. Republican. So you had quite a few of those in New York in the old days, Jacob Javix yeah. and yeah. John Lindsay and, and uh, uh, Rockefeller. Even Rockefeller, course. right. And, yeah. uh, uh, and then, you know, but the Republican Party has gone so far to the right. And I'm a political independent at this point. Uh, I, I believe, unfortunately, our two political parties, as they try and raise more and more money, but they become dependent on vested interests. Uh, and so you, you can have a lot of elections where you have two candidates that have very different positions. Uh, and one may be a good person. I think, for example, Joe Biden is a very good person and everything. Uh, Donald Trump is not. Uh, so I think that's an obvious choice, but I'd have to emphasize, I think both political bodies are utterly dependent on vested uh, financial interests in order to raise the cash you need to win an election and to fix our campaign finance system uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of a lot of difficulty getting things done in Washington and really need to get done as far as any sort of third party developing I, we've had on our show here Nick Brana I think he might be coming on next few weeks who is an interested in developing a, uh, a, a an independent uh, uh, people's party in which he uh, actually over the last couple of years was hoping that Bernie would uh, become part of, but obviously he didn't. Do you see any, any you know, life in that, that possibility of that making a difference? The well, larger you, political culture. Yes, the, the problem is that um, um, with our current voting system, if you vote for third party, your vote just uh, counts against uh, yes. the major party candidate. Um, if you had a system where people could have a rank choice voting and you rank your first choice and say, okay, I want the, you know, whoever it is, it could be a green party or a right to life or whatever you want is your first choice. And then you say, my second choice is the Democrat or the Republican. Uh, and then if your first choice, uh, dropped out, your, your vote would still be worth something. Mm -hmm. And then you get the third parties in there and they could come up on the right, left, middle, everywhere, social issues, environmental issues, um, or whatever. And those third parties might very well be able to have some influence uh, and might actually win some races. These people could say, okay, I'll vote for the, uh, you know, the party that wants single payer health insurance. That's my first choice. But if I don't get that, I'm going to choose the Democrat. Uh, but without the ranked choice voting, then you've got what we call the Jill Stein effect, or back in 2000, the Ralph Nader effect, uh, when they took Al Gore versus Bush election. And, and uh, people generally don't want that. So that, that's the problem with the third party movement. You need the ranked choice voting, or it's not going to go anywhere. Right, right. And so we're left basically with movements and organizing to push uh, in particular, the Democratic Party to take more progressive stands. Um, I wonder, uh, you know, I, I, I know you're probably aware of, of, of uh, Michelle Alexander's work. She has a very interesting piece in today's Times. I wonder, you know, as an expert on ethics and, and, and discussion on, 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 on morality and so on, and also what I perceive to, to be your your stand that, that, as you said before, there's good business, there's bad business. What might you want to say about the prison military industrial complex, the privatization of prisons? And to quote um, Michelle's article here, um, uh, more than 95% of people in prison will come home one day if they live that long. The issue is not whether they should come home, but when. 
According to a recent study by the ACLU, failure to aggressively de de uh, incarcerate us, uh, the country could add 100,000 fatalities to the overall U.S. death count among people both in and outside of jail. Do you see that as something that we can address at a business level, at a moral level, uh, at a political level? Certainly the, the popularization of, of the privatization of prisons adds to this dilemma, doesn't it? I mean, in other words, the, the corporations may not be all that benign. And, and again, they're, they've taken over, many have taken over prisons, um, with the idea that we can, they can run it better. So, um, yes. how much you answer this? Well, it is related to the problem you point out with the military-industrial complex, uh, which is a phrase that President Eisenhower used uh, to describe what was going on when you have the uh, uh, big defense manufacturers get in there with the uh, people in the Pentagon, and you always want to spend more and more money. And President Eisenhower was a general, and you know he understood how that game works. And uh, this should be a concern to people of all ends of the political spectrum. It shouldn't be a progressive versus conservative or whatever. Mm -hmm. How much money do you spend on your military and are you spending it effectively? Because that's money you're pulling out of the rest of the economy. Uh, you're gonna have to raise taxes. You're gonna have to pull it out of education and healthcare. Um, you, we may disagree about what else, what you do with the rest of the money. If you could save something on the military, but we spend an enormous amount on, on, on our military, and that's exactly what Eisenhower was worried about, and, and uh, uh, it's just got a heck of a lot worse. With prisons, it's the same thing, uh, not as much money, uh, but uh, still at billions and billions of dollars in the prison, and then we got the private companies making money out of it, uh, of incarcerating people. The social costs are astronomical, because people go into these prisons, uh, they certainly don't come out with, with training in, uh, uh, in areas where they can make a productive contribution to the economy, or it's very, very uh, because the prison system is not geared toward rehabilitation. Uh, it's just geared toward the, if it's a for-profit prison, it's making the profits uh, and uh, uh, so forth. Uh, of course, it's disproportionately minorities who are stuck in a lot of the prisons uh, for um, uh, nonviolent crimes. The war on drugs, a large part of it, and that's one of the few things I think Governor Rockefeller got wrong was going down that road um, in, in New York and that the next administration brought nationwide and uh, you know the whole war on drugs thing has been a disaster um, so we we do need to look at how are we spending government money um, but this should be a conservative or moderate libertarian as well as liberal progressive cause because this we don't get as a society as a whole uh, anything out of uh, is having a few companies, uh, you know, a very small slice of corporate America get rich off the prison industry while the rest of us are paying for it. So it's bad business. It's a, it's a bad business because they're using connections in the government to get contracts you shouldn't be getting. We don't need that kind of capacity in our prisons because we don't need so many people in the prisons. You need the dangerous people put away in the prisons. Uh, you don't need to take some young person who just you, you got picked up for selling the, uh, too much dope on the streets and put him in a prison where he's trained to become a violent criminal, serving a 10-year sentence, and some corporations making a profit off it. Uh, I mean, that's lose-lose for everybody, but whoever's making the profit. But, but here's the dilemma, Richard, which you're pointing out. Which I mean, this is crystal clear. Many of us know it's it's bad business, it's irrational, it's illogical, and yet these policies still continue. So how do you explain that? Do we I guess we have to need to get Bandy Lee back in here? I mean, this is just nuts in times. I mean, what are we what are we doing here? Well, a large part of it is a campaign finance system with politics operates. Uh, and I, I wrote a book, uh, I was at the Safford Center for Ethics at Harvard back in 2015. Uh, and uh, I didn't even mention Donald Trump in this book. It was a book on campaign finance. And I was trying to persuade more conservative and pro-business groups to support campaign finance reform. And one of the points I made, it's a terrible collective action problem. I mean, go back to this thing with prisons. It's only a handful of corporations that actually make a lot of money on that. But they make the political contributions get what they want. And what they want is billions of our tax dollars. 
Right. Well, that's going to come at the expense of everyone else who pays taxes, and that includes a lot of rich people too. <laughs> In other words, if you were to ask, you know, even corporate America, is this a good idea? A lot of CEOs would say, no, it stinks to high heaven. But the CEO who's making the cash on the deal puts the money into the system and gets what he wants, while the other CEOs have their own thing, whether it's loose regulation of the financial system on Wall Street or some other priority you know, for the fossil fuel folks. So everybody's putting money in the system to get what they want, even though it's something that hurts the collective well-being right including the collective well-being of even the very rich, if you only cared about the very rich, which right. of course we don't. But I don't think this is a system, what we've got, uh, even though we have terrible distribution of income, that really benefits on the whole, even the very rich. I mean, look at global warming, look at the look at the pandemic. I mean, we didn't spend the money we could have and should have spent on preparing for a pandemic that Barack Obama warned us about it. George W. Bush warned us about it. Uh, Barack Obama had a plan, written that up. Trump didn't do anything with it, didn't care. Too busy golfing. Uh, so we've got a messed up system and everybody's being hurt from rich to poor. The poor are being hurt more than anybody else, of course, but this is completely messed up. And just in the couple of minutes we have to, to bring it full circle, what you're trying to do in, you know, whistleblowing here and going after the rich and the super rich who are abusing their power, as I heard you in the last, you know, discussion here on, on military industrial complex and corporate elites, this is exactly what needs to be done to begin to have a semblance of checks and balances in the country. Yes, we need that. And we need the, the people who are well to do. Uh, to hold each other accountable. Uh, you know, we, we need more Wall Street execs. If they are not willing to speak out for regulation of Wall Street, I wish they would, at least speak out against the fossil fuel industry and what's going on there uh, in exactly. the for-profit prison industry. Uh, we need uh, people who are in high positions in society who have managed to accumulate wealth to realize they have an obligation to give something back uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to speak out when something's wrong. And, and we've seen that. I, you know, I think that uh, Bill Gates has done a good job of speaking out about the way the COVID-19 yeah. uh, crisis has been handled. Uh, uh, Mike Bloomberg did a very good job uh, speaking out against the Trump administration for gun, uh, gun regulations. I, sure, I, I think there may have been better ways for him to spend his money than running for president. But uh, uh, I believe we have, you know, some people are very successful business people who have been very responsible in speaking out on a number of these issues and against the way Donald Trump has abused his power, uh, Warren Buffett and others. But we need more of that. Uh, there's not an opportunity to just sit back and make a lot of money mm -hmm. and uh, let the world go on down the, you know, down the tubes. Uh, uh, we need more of the spirit we had among some prominent people in the business community during World War II when people recognized that you need to put your country first. It wasn't just an opportunity to make a lot of cash. I agree with you on that, Richard. I wish we could go on. We're about out of time. From your mouth to God's ears, amen. Uh, agree with you very much on that. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day uh, in beautiful Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes. Thank you so much. And we'll talk with you soon again, I hope. All Absolutely. the best. Thank you. And thank you so much for watching us here on The Radical Imagination. This is Jim Bredos, and we'll see you again next week on The Radical Imagination. And we'll go out with Phil Oaks, The Power and the Glory. Come on and take a walk with me through this green and growing land. Walk through the meadows and the mountains and the sand. Walk through the valleys and the rivers and the plains. Walk through the sun and walk through the rain. Here's a land full of power and glory. Beauty that words cannot recall. All her power shall rest on the strength of her freedom. Glory shall rest on us all. 
From Colorado, Kansas, and the Carolinas too. Virginia and Alaska, from the old to the new. Texas and Ohio and the California shore. Tell me who could ask for more. Here is a land full of power and glory. Beauty that words cannot recall. All her power shall rest on the strength of her freedom. Glory shall rest on us all. Yet she's only as rich as the poorest of the poor. Only as free as a padlock prison door. Only as strong as our love for this land. Only as tall as we stand. For here is a land full of power and glory. Beauty that words cannot recall. For her power shall rest on the strength of her freedom. Glory shall rest on us all. Come on and take a walk with me through this green and growing land. Walk through the meadows and the mountains and the sand. Walk through the valleys and the rivers and the plains. Walk through the sun and walk through the rain. Here is a land full of power and glory. Beauty that words cannot recall. For her power shall rest on the strength of her freedom. Glory shall rest on us all, on us all.